Hello, everyone, and welcome to our program. My name is Sarah. I'm a librarian at the Mastic Marcia Shirley Community Library. And today we're very happy to bring you the National Park Service uh, Explore the Salt Marshes, the Fire Island Salt Marshes. Pat, uh, Ranger Pat Riley from the Fire Island National Seashore will be telling us all about it. Uh, Pat has been with the Fire Island National Seashore for about seven years now, after having careers in the U.S. Navy and as a teacher. With that, I'll say let's take it away, Pat. All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you to Tara and the Mastic Richard Shirley Community Library for having me back. I'm really liking these programs, especially, you know, meeting people who come down to our Wilderness Visitor Center um, for programs who I've met virtually. So that's really fun. Um, and uh, I'm a park ranger at Fire Island National Seashore. I work at all the stations there, including this video station from my kitchen. And um, I just wanted to this time, I've, I haven't done this before, but go over the Zoom controls for people who might not be familiar. Um, there is a, a mute button, there's a little microphone. If you click on it, you can unmute yourself. Um, make sure you're muted through most of the program, unless you want to say something. Um, you can put questions into the chat box. So if you sort of hover your mouse over the, um, the chat, you can ask a question. And with my screen sharing, I might not be able to see it, but Tara certainly will, and she'll, um, she'll pass those questions on to me. So feel free to stop and ask questions. We do, we've usually had time to do that during the program. Um, I'll tell you if it's something I'm gonna cover in a minute. So um, I'll talk about the salt marsh. Now the salt marsh, it's a lot of people look at it and say, boy, that's just a lot of grass, uh, but it is a really, really important habitat and ecosystem on Fire Island and on much of the South shore of Long Island. So wherever you have these sort of wet areas, sort of bog, um, not really swampy. Swampy, if you think swamp, it has water on it all the time. The salt marsh is inundated with the Great South Bay, bay water at the high tides and fully covered uh, during the full moon and new moon, extra high tides. But, um, it, it's more, it's so much more than grass. So National Seashore. And just to get an idea, um, it is 26 miles, 30, 32 miles long. But if we take off Robert Moses State Park down on the left hand side, the west end, it's 26 miles and it's long and skinny. And the northern edge of it which faces the Great South Bay is an awful lot of salt marsh. And also the South Shore of Long Island. Um, if you live in the Massac Shirley area, you'll know that when you go down near the bay, you end up with all these grasses and reeds. So we're gonna look at what we find there. Um, we have, this is a diagram of Watch Hill. So um, our Watch Hill Visitor Center and marina are set in the middle of the, mar in, of the salt marsh. So if you kind of look at this, the top of the picture would be the ocean beach, and then there's dunes, and all of this sort of light green area at the bottom, uh, close to the bay, is, um, is salt marsh. It's a huge part of it. We build our marinas in it. We put nature trails through it, and uh, we have a really terrific uh, nature trail at Watch Hill goes all through the salt marsh and you can uh, you see it there. And we're gonna pretty much look at the salt marsh at Watch Hill because that's where that's the, the site with the biggest. Um, so here's the nature trail. And um, do, is there, I can't see it on my screen, Tara, but is there a um, raise your hand button where people can raise hands? If not in the chat, has anybody been to Watch Hill? I'm just curious. You could type a yes into the chat. I can't really, see. I see a couple, I see a little light flashing that someone's typing something in the chat. So 
So, um, at first glance, if you look at this picture, we're looking out to north to the Great South Bay. Um, it looks like a lot of grass, but it is one of the most productive in terms of the biomass produced. It is comparable to a, a northern forest with the amount of um, biomass that is contained here. It is, um, there's nutrients from runoff. So when it rains, the water runs toward the bay, there's all this runoff. And the, um, the roots of this are really, really uh, dense and strong. So it acts as sort of a buffer against storm surges on the bay side. And this is very true of the South Shore of Long Island as well. Um, and the, a really good comparison is this. Somebody told me this once. Um, if you were to drop a glass of water on your hard floor, it's gonna run along the whole floor. If you drop a glass of water on a carpet, it's not gonna go as far. And because it's absorbed, and the same thing sort of happens with the salt marsh. It absorbs the water, and this way it buffers the, um, the, the force of the water. It stops the water from, from moving further than the salt marsh. Um, it's also a nursery for immature shrimp, crabs, and fish. Because the tidal flooding happens, fish lay their eggs on here, and they're protected from the larger predators that can't get up onto the salt marsh because the water's shallow. It also is a filter and it filters pollutants out of the water. So it does all these things. And uh, we're gonna look into, into those uh, in a little more depth. So this is an island cross section. And again, from left to right, just like that picture of um, Watch Hill, this is actually the cross section at Sailor's Haven because we have a, a really well-developed secondary dune there. But if you look at, um, from the left, the ocean beach, there's a primary dune, the swale, which is the sort of dry area in between. If there's a secondary dune, and there isn't a secondary dune everywhere on Fire Island, only where it's wide enough. And then the salt marsh is over to the right. So 40% of the landmass of Fire Island is wetlands. Um, so the, the numbers are, are there on the screen for you to see. That's 10% would be forest. So this, the sunken forest is an example. There's a small patch of maritime forest at Watch Hill, if you've ever been there. Um, open beach and swale, another 25%, and 25% is developed with homes, marinas, and so on. So we're gonna look at some of the plants because they are the stars here, the grasses. So. Um, they are specially adapted to life in the salt marsh. They are highly salt tolerant. So um, high tide, um, ra raise your hand or comment in the chat if you're not clear on how the tides work. Um, I can give you just a brief overview and I can go into more depth if anybody would like me to. But the moon, the, the force, uh, the, well, the pull of the moon's gravity, as the moon goes around the earth, tugs the surface of the water. So as the moon goes around the earth, twice a day, we're gonna get this, the water pulled up, and then as in between cycles, it's, it, it runs back down because it's being pulled somewhere else. So about twice a day, and it's just a little over six hours apart, you get a high tide and a low tide, and the salt marsh, much of it where the grasses are, is totally underwater during the high tide. So the edges of this, which we're gonna talk about as well, sort of the periphery, little higher ground, might not get flooded quite so often, might get only the, the uh, full moon extra high tide. So these grasses, again, look, it's not just grass. So we have um, smooth cord grass. This one on the left is um, looks a lot like beach grass. And I just want to show you these two side by side, and then we're going to talk about them. And the one on the right is called salt meadow hay, and it grows on slightly higher ground. And 
Um, so the, the cord grass on the left looks a lot like beach grass, straight uh, sort of thick strands of grass, blades of grass, while the um, salt meadow hay is a little bit thinner and it lays down in these sort of cowlicks. So it's, you can really see uh, the difference when you're out there on the salt marsh because they look quite different. So the smooth cord grass is a little bit of a close up. Um, can grow right in the salt water. It doesn't grow underwater. It is flooded twice a day. So it, uh, it's highly salt tolerant. And this grass is really interesting because it is able to sort of um, release the salt from the salt water onto the surface of the, of the blade of grass. So if you were to go, this, if you come to Watch Hill and we go out in the salt marsh, what I usually do is pluck a piece of this and if you run your finger up the blade of grass, you actually have salt crystals on your hand. Um, it's that, that much salt is coming out of this grass. Um, it dies back in the fall and the decaying matter and the roots form this mat. And that is the marsh or the, the bog itself. And it's black and icky. And if you step in it, you sort of sink in. It's, um, but it's thick, it's very, very um, high in organic matter. So it's really, really rich in nutrients um, and it collects organic sediments and inorganic sediments when the salt spray comes up. So it's a, it's a really great ecosystem full of energy, even though it looks like it's just grass. Salt meadow hay, it looks a little bit different. Here's a little close, um, close up of it, it's the second most plentiful grass. It grows a little bit higher, a little bit higher ground. So it might be in patches that have a little bit of more elevation, but that elevation is created by the cord grass decaying and adding a volume uh, to the marsh. So we have these two grasses that are highly salt tolerant. This is another one, and it's not a grass, but it's another plant that you find right at the water's edge called glass wart or salicornia. And I'm very curious to see if anybody's familiar. So please give me a yes in the chat if you are familiar at all with salicornia or glass wart. Anybody? There we have somebody. Let me see if I can see who it is. No, okay, we gotta know. <laughs> um, it is a succulent. If you can, you can actually kind of see it in the picture. It's a succulent. Um, and the name glasswort comes from it, its use in making glass. So especially in England, um, they would burn this and the salts left behind were used in making, in glass making. So it's also called sea beans. And it, this is something you can Google, a recipe for sea beans. And it's not a bean, has nothing to do with beans, but it's sort of um, maybe the thickness of um, a very thin string bean, let's say. And it's very salty, it's edible. Um, back in uh, pioneer days, it was used for pickling and for adding salt to food. Um, so it's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting plant. And what I love about it is in the fall, it turns red. And it's beautiful red, sort of succulent, short, maybe eight or 10 inches tall all over the salt marsh. So we have an interesting, um, oops, I'm having trouble moving the screen. There we go. Um, a phenomenon, let's say, something you may have noticed in the salt marsh are these ditches. And all throughout Fire Island and Long Island, and I'm gonna show you an aerial picture and we'll be able to pick them out. They are everywhere. If you are, have ever walked on the marsh or near the marsh by the bay, you'll see these uh, maybe two, three foot wide ditches. And in 1940, there was, what I from what I understand, one case of malaria in New York. 
and they decided, and at that time, um, the Civilian Conservation Corps was sort of this make work thing that um, Franklin Roosevelt had set up for men in the depression to give them jobs and, and do public works. And one of the public works they did was to dig these mosquito ditches. They thought it might be good for controlling mosquitoes. They are about 100 or 150 feet apart. And by 1940, 90% of the salt marshes on the Atlantic coast had been grid ditched. Um, because they thought that somehow they could get the water out of the salt marsh to control mosquitoes. Well, obviously, if the tide is coming up and down twice a day, it's going to come up even in, this, in these um, ditches. And it does, it did then, and it does now. And um, they were meant to be drainage ditches, but it didn't really work. Gave a lot of guys jobs, but Here's an aerial photo. So this is, again, Watch Hill. And on the left side is the marina. And you can see sort of that gray um, line, and that's the, the nature trail. And if you look to the right of that, in the salt marsh, you can see these lines. They're parallel lines, and they're not only just in here, they're everywhere. And if you look at, um, there's um, historical aerial maps that you can see, and these lines are all over, Fire Island and the South Shore of Long Island. Um, they actually continued doing this through the 1960s. And what they did was to put DDT on the surface of the water. Not good. We know now that DDT is really a pretty terrible chemical. Um, and just a little bit about that. Okay, we're killing mosquitoes. What's so bad about that? Well, if you consider that the mosquitoes are food for lots of birds and lots of fish, and the smaller fish eat a bunch of mosquitoes, and a bigger fish might eat a smaller fish that's eaten lots of mosquitoes and lots of little fish, and by the time an osprey picks up a fish, they were so full of DDT from all the mosquitoes eaten by all the fish that were eaten by the other fish that um, it, it was in the 1970s that they discovered uh, how bad this was for, uh, especially for birds of prey. These apex predators um, were exposed to so much DDT that their egg, the eggshells uh, became too thin to, to uh, be able to hatch eggs. So, Osprey and bald eagles were nearly to the point of extinction um, before they banned DDT. And most chemicals they put there now are still not really good for us. Um, but I read something that 2,841 miles of mosquito ditches were dug in Suffolk County. Just think about that. That's a lot. 15 million feet is with a number, but that's it's almost 3,000 miles of mosquito ditches just in Suffolk County. And when you figure 90% of the salt marsh up and down the East Coast was uh, dredged out into these mosquito ditches. But as well as the chemicals being bad, this interrupted the, the natural flow of water through the salt marsh as well. They were not a, a good idea. They were not a good idea. Um, the wetlands started to die, and we've actually lost a lot of uh, salt marsh. If you've been to Sailor's Haven, um, there's not any salt marsh because it's, it was all dug to death, let's say, and drowned. Um, so here's at um, ground level now. This is a mosquito ditch at Watch Hill, and um, it shows that they are, it, they are growing over the uh, edges of the salt marsh are building up more um, organic matter. They're slowly getting narrower and narrower. Uh, the, the Long Island salt marsh, um, we all live very close to the Wertheim uh, Wildlife Refuge or National Wildlife Refuge, yeah. And they, what they've done is put coconut fiber mats into these ditches to try to, to speed up the uh, the rate of of closing up because they're they're not good for um, they're not good for the environment. So 
this is a great sort of segue into the some of the other plants of the salt marsh now too because um, if you see this picture at sort of in the background we're starting to see some reeds okay and then behind that there's some some small trees this picture is actually looking up toward um, one of the higher parts of the Watch Hill uh, nature trail. So up in the upper left corner, you can see a little bit of boardwalk there. But um, the reeds that you see right beyond the salt marsh are called Phragmites. So I'm very curious to see, have you seen Phragmites and where? Everyone's seen Phragmites, I think. Can you think of where you've seen it? Because it's everywhere. Um, in my neighborhood alone, it grows along the roads. I live in Brookhaven. Um, it grows where there's been disturbed land in sumps where it's wet. And um, Phragmites is a very opportunistic plant. Um, it's not native. It's also known as the European common reed. And it can survive in both freshwater and brackish water. Not entirely salt water. So you see, you don't see it growing close to the bay. You see it growing on a little bit higher ground. And um, it, it has actually started to push out the native uh, cattails because it is so easily adaptable. So here's a couple of uh, these plants. So Phragmites is on the left. It is this European common reed. There is a variety that's native, but most of this was uh, brought over from Europe in early days and as a um, sort of a land break, as, as something to plant in areas where nothing else would grow because this stuff really grows. Um, and it grows in the little bit higher areas or more terrestrial, let's call it, areas of the salt marsh. Um, another of the trees we see is a groundsel tree. And um, this is a salt tolerant shrub, but it, it can't live where the tide uh, drowns its roots twice a day. It might be able to tolerate a, a full moon tide, uh, but not being, it's not um, adapted to living in salt water all the time, being inundated all the time. Um, so these are both very, very common uh, at the edges of the salt marsh. You may see them growing around your neighborhood if you live in the Massac Shirley area and marsh elder. And this one you can get, start to see the leaves as a little better photo. And it's called high tide bush. Um, some people also call the groundsel high tide bush. And that's exactly where it grows, where the high tide reaches. And it's, it's um, salt tolerant, not quite as much as the grasses. So let's, sum it up in the services that the salt marsh provides. It filters, some filters pollution, it traps sediments. So it's this great nutrient um, base for these plants to grow. And it's a nursery ground. So it's not, it's fish, crabs, um, shrimp, lay their eggs up in here. And um, they're protected somewhat from larger fish when they're in their very small stages, but as you can imagine, the shorebirds have a buffet, and, and, but that's important too. So it's, it's all, um, some of it is timed to the migration. So in the spring, when we have um, a lot of fish and crabs all laying eggs in there, that's exactly the time when some of our migrant bird, migratory birds are flying south and they stop off to feed there because it's a, it's a wonderful food source. And um, if you were to go to Watch Hill, you might see scientists out there. We have um, scientists monitoring the salt marsh all the time. They study soil elevation relative to sea level rise. And this is really important. Um, the salt marsh is elevating by the addition of more organic matter, decaying grasses, um, sediments that come from higher ground even nutrients and salts that might blow over from the ocean, all add um, altitude, let's call it. But 
sea level rise is catching up and there's a few spots in the salt marsh where you can see it's like looks like a white PVC pipe sticking out and these are some of these study uh, uh, study uh, grids I guess where they're uh, measuring the elevation and also sampling you can see they're taking a core sample here um, down into the marsh you can see how those roots are compacted and this can help scientists determine when the salt marsh was formed so pretty interesting stuff out there as well as you know the plant and animal um, studies that happen out there so let's move from uh, from grasses to birds. And here are a couple of the really common birds that um, you get to see if you walk around the salt marsh. And you'll see them on Long Island as well as on Fire Island. So on the left, this uh, white shorebird is an egret. Now, there's two kinds of egrets we have um, on Long Island. And they look very, very similar. So this photo, I'll tell you the truth, I can't tell which kind it is. We have a great egret and a snowy egret. So the great egret is bigger. So if you saw a... Okay, sorry for that. I, back? Know, I think so. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm not sure. I had a problem earlier too. Um, so I'm telling my I have to share my screen again. <laughs> okay. Are we back? Wait, it Where looks like you... we're back. <laughs> I'm not sure. Let's just uh -oh. continue. The recording is still occurring, it looks like. So Okay. 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 So you were <laughs> at the you were at the point of um, discussing the differences in the egret. Okay, thanks. Um, all of a sudden all I had was my PowerPoint on my screen. <laughs> so the great egret is bigger, the snowy egret is smaller in size. So if they're uh, next to each other, you can tell the difference. But if they're flying overhead and you look at their legs, they both have black legs, but the snowy egret has yellow feet, which is just odd. So it looks like he has rubber boots on. Um, so we can't see this bird's feet in the picture, but it is an egret of some kind. On the right, the bird is a willet. So um, this is a brownish marsh bird. Um, maybe twice the size of a blue jay, if that's a good comparison. And um, they're most easily recognized when they fly. When they fly, they have big patches of white on their wings. And otherwise, they're nearly invisible in the marsh. They are just brown birds. And both the egret and the willet have these long legs for wading and long bills for reaching down into the grasses to feed. So these are some of the birds that are feeding on those immature fish or crabs or shrimp. Here's a couple of other ones that we see. And um, the one on the left, can anyone name it? Because this is fairly common everywhere. Trying to see the chat. Oh, come on. Somebody can name this bird. Well, it's a black bird with red on its wings. So it's the red winged blackbird. So the red winged blackbird um, is eating insects and seeds. And as 
distinctive as the male. This is the male. The female is just brown and looks like an oversized sparrow. So it's very interesting. Um, often you see females roosting together separately from the males, and they're they're pretty distinctive um, when they fly and when when they're just sitting like this. And this is a very um, common pose, hanging onto a, a piece of grass or a reed. The birds on the right, and I don't expect anybody to know this bird because I just learned it about five years ago. They are not common except in the salt marsh. And it might look like a blackbird or even a cat bird, but if you notice that white fringe, sort of white edging on its tail feathers, it is an Eastern Kingbird. And it's the same size as the red-winged blackbird. And it sort of lives in the same habitat. They are very, very territorial. So you hear them and see them when you walk into their territory. Um, here's another bird and it's tough to see, uh, but it's different than all the other birds. Okay, it's a, it's a wading bird. We see the long legs. It's, uh, it feeds in the marsh, it has a long bill, but the bill on this bird curves down. It's a downward curving bill and it's the only bird that will look like this in the marsh and it's called a glossy ibis. And they look more like something you see in a tropical um, sort of setting, but they, and they're uncommon, but we do see them on the salt marsh and um, glossy, they are glossy black, almost an iridescent uh, sort of greenish um, on their feathers and very pretty. Here's another one that we see in the springtime now while it's breeding, it looks very, very colorful like this. It looks different from all the other little sandpiper-like birds. This is called a ruddy turnstone. So ruddy for the reddish turnstone because that's what it does. It turns over stones to find little small creatures in the sand to eat. And once it's done breeding in the spring, it goes back to looking sort of dull, brownish, beige, like most of the other sandpiper type birds we see. But we do see these through the salt marsh. And I mean, there's a lot of other birds. I could go on and on because we'll have gulls, swans, geese, all sorts of birds that, that live near the water are, are near the, the salt marsh because they are, they're finding food there. It's really, really uh, rich in, um, in food sources. So here are some of the predators of the salt marsh. And um, interesting because you don't think of these animals as being predators. On the left, we have barn swallows. So a barn swallow, um, they have a forked tail and they fly, they flit and fly really quickly and they sort of seem to be zooming up and down and every which way because they're eating mostly mosquitoes. So we like these guys because they eat mosquitoes all day long with this sort of erratic flight pattern just because they're catching mosquitoes as they go. These are the birds that live, um, they make mud nests under the eaves of houses, sometimes you might see um, in barns, but um, it's one of the types of swallows that we have out there uh, in the salt marsh. And um, the bug eating thing is really good. The dragonfly on the right is another predator and it's very interesting. Um, there are many kinds of dragonflies and I will not pretend to identify any of them. There's big, small, blue, yellow, black, green, um, all sizes. The shape is the same though. They've got four very slender wings and a very long abdomen and they are harmless. Um, when I was a girl, I was terrified of them because I guess my grandmother called them darning needles. And I thought, oh gosh, that's a needle. It's not, they're just long and thin and they have beautiful colors, all of them. And they eat mosquitoes. Again, we love them because they eat mosquitoes. And what's interesting is 
they, uh, if you're aware, mosquitoes have a larval form. So this is the reason why in the summer we say don't leave standing water outside because the, um, the mosquitoes will breathe there and they, they go through this part of their life cycle in the water. Well, so do dragonflies. And the dragonfly larvae eat mosquito larvae. So in both of their life forms, they are predators, which is terrific. And some of them spend two years as in their larval form. Some spend two weeks in the larval form. So they're quite different species, um, similar in that they're all predators of mosquitoes. So we like them. Something else we see in the salt marsh are turtles. Again, they're eating everything that the birds are, the small fish, um, the uh, shrimp, crabs, and so on. Um, the one on the left is a snapping turtle. If you've ever seen a snapping turtle, they're really sort of prehistoric looking. Um, they can weigh up to 35 pounds and be 20 inches long. So that's almost as big as a garbage can lid. Um, and they are not able to withdraw their head and legs completely into their shell. So their defense mechanism is to snap. And they do, they bite. Um, don't bother one if you see them. And the one on the right is a diamondback terrapin. And they are um, much smaller. They're maybe six, five and a half to six inches for a male, maybe nine inches for a female in length. And um, same thing, they're out in the salt marsh and very well camouflaged, these guys. So you, you might never see them, um, but they, they live in our estuaries where there's fresh water. They're not salt water turtles. These are both in the salt marsh, there's fresh water, remember, where it's, the, it's um, sort of runoff from the higher ground. There's rainwater that collects out there. Um, but you usually don't see them swimming in the bay. No, it's not, it's not impossible. Um, any questions? I've covered a, some of the animals, the plants, um, birds, there's a lot more to see. I would recommend anybody come to Watch Hill, for example. We do a uh, nature walk right through the salt marsh every day. And there's, there's something different every day there. It's really fun. Um, and you have salt marsh, if you're observant, you might see some of these birds and animals um, right down the block from where you live, because everybody here lives close to the water. So, questions? Oh, red-winged blackbird, I just looked at the comments. Yep, Hayden, you got it. At the bottom of the screen, I've put our website. And um, if you go to the calendar on our website, you can see our pro upcoming programs. You'll be able to see the hours and so on uh, when we're out there. We do salt marsh tours pretty much every day. And you're, you're welcome to walk through our, our beautiful nature trail on your own as well. Let's see if I can see everybody. No. Well. Well, that was really interesting. I'm, well, I was curious, are there um, snakes in there? Um, yes, there, there are a few. Not in the salt marsh as much as in sort of the, the drier, more terrestrial areas in the forest. We have two kinds of snakes on Fire Island. Um, uh, regular garter snakes, like you find in the garden, they're harmless. And black racer snakes, which are also harmless. They're not venomous. And racer gives a good idea of what they do when they see people. They race away. Um, but we do see them sometimes on the boardwalks. Mm -hmm. Not often. Am 
Well, I'm happy you guys could come and I hope everybody yes. enjoyed it and learned something. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Pat, for doing that presentation. I, that was really interesting about the, the plants, the glass wart and doing mm -hmm. the, um, making the sand, boiling it down for the sand to make the glass. That was. Right. Good. For the ash, it's the ash from it. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about glass making, okay? But I know that the salts in ash are used. So there's different methods, but this was definitely one that was burned for the, the salts in the ash. So, all right. Well, well thank you. Next month. Yes. <laughs> And just to say, next month we'll be doing this again. Uh, we will learn all about horseshoe crabs. And that will be on Wednesday, June 9th at 7 o'clock, also on Zoom. Uh, you can register for that program through our community calendar, our, our calendar at communitylibrary.org slash programs. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you everyone for Perfect. coming. Thank you, Pat, for a great, a great presentation again. All right. Good to see you again. Bye, everybody. Bye.